care because I felt that those people who were locked up were still a part of our community. I say this all the time. Their families are here, and most of them are coming back. <clears throat> They're part of this community. So you can't say lock them up and throw away the key, and who cares? Every single one of us ought to care because they are our brothers and their sisters. They are. Thank you. Why do I feel like crying? <laughs> Because that concept is very moving, and it's totally central to what we do. Thank you. That's it. On August 28, 1971, by the underground bomb, the California Department of Corrections buildings in San Francisco and Sacramento. Seven days earlier, the guards had shot and killed the charismatic prisoner activist George Jackson. Jackson had entered the prison as an 18-year-old sentenced to a one-year-to-life sentence for a secondary role in a $70 robbery. As often happened with a black prisoner who showed any self-respect and defiance, 10 years later, he still had no prospect of parole. In the interim, he had transformed himself into a well-read and extremely eloquent adv advocate for black power, social justice, and revolution. In his book, Soledad Brother, is one of the most moving works of the time and still inspiring people today. Jackson was a, a field marshal in the Black Panther Party and he was considered the leading national figure in the spearhead of prison resistance. Clearly, authorities wanted him dead. And regardless of the different versions of how events played out that day, they fulfilled their wish on August 21st, 1971. My personal response was so emotional that a long po poem, and I was someone who virtually never wrote poetry, simply erupted out of me. The Weather Underground, which had barely escaped getting wiped out in March, had bombed two different uh, California Department of Correction offices in two different cities in August. George Jackson's death proved to be the catalyst 2,500 miles away in Attica, New York, for the biggest and most dramatic prison uprising in U.S. history. Prisoners had already been organizing there against brutal and demeaning conditions, but it was the murder of greatly admired Jackson that pushed activity to a higher gear. On September 9, 1971, about 1,500 prisoners took over D Block Yard, holding about 40 guards hostage as a protection against attack. They developed a list of 14 practical proposals about ending the prevailing racism, brutality, religious persecution, and lack of constructive programs. Later, they added five political demands, such as being allowed asylum in anti-imperialist countries. The 21-year-old L.D. Barclay stated in the, central, the central theme most eloquently, we are men, we are not beasts, and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. The prisoners called in a number of respected outsiders, such as Black Panther Party Chairman Bobby Seale, radical lawyer William Kunstler, to act as mediators. Underground, we followed the unfolding of the takeover for those first three days with intense interest and high hopes. The civil rights and then black power movements had created a context to finally expose the inhumanity of prison conditions in the U.S. The rebellion exemplified how black power could be a spearhead to unite all the oppressed as black, Puerto Rican, Native American, Asian, and white prisoners stood up together. Believing the level of public scrutiny was a shield against mass murder, I was hopeful for a positive resolution with significant reforms. But New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller calculated that his ambition to become president would be best served by a tough on crime stance. He refused to come to Attica and negotiate and ordered state troopers to retake the prison by force on September 13th. That all out assault left 39 men dead, 29 prisoners and 10 guards, and another 89 wounded. Recognizable leaders like L.D. Barkley and Sam Melville, a white anti-imperialist in prison for bombings that had preceded the Weather Underground, were killed. Since a guard and three prisoners had died earlier in the takeover, the total death toll was 43. The news of the police assault and, and the 39 deaths was shocking and sickening. I was furious at the state's violence, but also at the media's lies. Headlines initially screamed that the inmates had killed 
ten hostages by slashing their throats, and some of those murdered guards had been castrated with their private parts stuffed into their mouths. <laughs> the next day, the autopsies revealed that not one hostage was killed in any, in any way or cut in any way with the knife. All ten had died from state troopers' gunfire. Meanwhile, the prisoners who had treated their hostages humanely were being tortured quite literally with kicks, broken glass, and cigarette burns by the authorities who retook the prison. But that didn't make the news. We felt an absolute imperative to express our solidarity with the prisoners and to highlight for white youth the central importance of Attica. On September 17th, the Weather Underground bombed the U.S. Department of Correctional Services headquarters in Albany. I'm going to read one more short part here. The government that dropped napalm in Vietnam, that provides the cluster bombs used against civilians in Lebanon, that trains torturers in El Salvador, calls us terrorists. The rulers who have grown rich on generations of slave labor and slave wages label us as criminals. The police forces of America who have murdered 2,000 people of color over the past five years and who flood the communities with drugs say that we have no respect for human lives. Yeah. We are neither terrorists nor criminals. It's precisely because of our love, because we revel in the human spirit, that we became freedom fighters against this racist and deadly imperialist system. That, that last part is from David's sentencing statement in court. And I guess I just wanted to read those things because I think that one of the most significant things that David has kind of taught me um, over the years is, is that there's this common slogan uh, Che Guevara says that the true revolutionary is guided by me, great feelings of love. And um, I just think that David is a really good example of that. He is somebody who most certainly did not want to do, grow up to do armed robberies and um, plan a bomb in the Pentagon, but was, was directed in that, in that trajectory because he was um, very much, it, it loved people. He loved the community, he loved the environment. He wanted to stop excuse me, evil and unjust things that he just could not ignore, that were not going to go away by holding signs. And um, I first visited him, uh, I think it was like 2002, 2003, and I was really angry, you know, and in a lot of ways, I'm a very angry person, as I think we all should be. Um, and coming in, in contact with people like David helps Remind us all of what we're fighting for and what we're working for, and uh, why we take risks that might end us up in prison for 75 years of life. Sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> so that's all I gotta say. chapters, he even brought up, you know, our black, the songs some of our black singers were singing back in the day and stuff. And <coughs> I think, to me, 
James Brown was one of the ones that made us really look up and to let us know that we are somebody. But he made the record, I'm black and I'm proud. You see what I'm saying? Because a lot of us, we still had the slavery into <coughs> our You know what I'm saying? That we wasn't equal to anybody else, you know. And James Brown made that come to our attention, you know. And Marvin Gaye had made him up with the war and stuff like this. And, you know, and it was just different things, you know, that really touched us young people. And we flashed the little radios along the street, you know, playing these songs. And it made us become more curious about the other side of the world. So the thing that I'm hoping is, as an audience, I'm glad y'all came out to hear this because it's really something that's very important that needs to be heard with our ears. And I was hoping that, you know, y'all find it interesting because all of this stuff is true and it's not like fake or put together or anything. It's true, you know, and I'm 62. Nobody could have came and told me how hard a white person would come out and struggle. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, really struggle. No matter what somebody else is saying to them, they're going to still go keep straight forward. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They don't get sidetracked. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I have met some beautiful people, and I call them my family because that's the way I feel, mm -hmm. and that's the way they make me feel. Mm -hmm. You know? So, and mm -hmm. David, reading his book, is showing me how long that's been going on back there. I only knew it too. I'm telling you now, I'm being honest with you. I was raised up, I was raised up by Myrtle on the other side of Swan Street. That's where I was uh, born at, on that street. And we had this couple. I don't even know right today if Miss Mary and Mr. Sam was married or they were just a couple. I don't know. They lived in a baby mansion inside the playground that was right there at Myrtle and Seneca on Cedar Street. It was a big playground for a baby mansion. And at the time, the white, the uh, neighborhood was still pretty much white. And the black people were starting to move in. So the white people started moving out. And the ones that was left there for a while, they was causing problems for Mary, for Miss Mary and Mr. Sam because they were really our babysitters. You see what I'm saying? They kept us in line. They taught us how to be respectful to each other because we had the blacks, we had white, we had Puerto Ricans. And we came to the playground and we'll play. Miss Mary, bless her heart. She was sickly and she had cancer. But she took the time to bring us in her mansion, in her kitchen, and taught us how to cook little things, you know, to keep us occupied while our parents is at work to come and feed us. Because she know that we had both her parents working, and a lot of times we we're in the house during the day by ourselves. They took the time with us. And Mr. Sam, he taught the boys how to play baseball. He taught them how to play basketball and get along with each other. And as Mary passed away, everybody was hurt. She used to take us down to the city hall to sing Christmas carols in front of the city hall. You know, she did these things. And the people was trying to sign petitions to move them out of here, to make them leave the area. And Mr. Sam, I don't know who he knew downtown, but he fought it. And he won it. And then as the years went by, he decided that the baby mansion was too big for just for him to stay in it. He let him tear it down. So when they tore the mansion down, they made a bigger playground for us. So now we had two playgrounds in the area. We had that one, and then further down on Chicago, there was another big playground. But it had different equipment. They had the maypoles and stuff like that down there. And he made sure we got along, and he did things with us. 
Now his brother, that was a different story. This is where we started learning about racism when we were introduced in the wrong fashion, you know, of his brother. His brother, he was one of the mobs. You know, people don't really believe that they had mobs and stuff back then here. And that was one of the neighbors had someone come out of town to visit. And he, by him not being from here, he was on Swan Street and he went into this bar to have a drink. Well, Mr. Sam brother and some of the other people, he didn't bother anybody. He was just sitting there and he had a, a beer. And they broke the bottle and he left out of the bar. And they ran him down and they beat him to death mm. inside the projects right there on Pine Street where Emergency Hospital used to be. About a block down from there, they beat him to death. He didn't bother anybody just because he came to the bar. He didn't know. But anyway, he was up here visiting and he never went back, you know. He, when he did, he didn't go back alive, I'll put it that way. They shipped his body to where he came from, you know. Nothing was ever done, you know, about it. So, it's a lot of different things that's very touching. And I, um, for the first time at the age of 62, I really went on a real trip. I rode the train. When I was three, my mom took me to Richmond. And you know, the little girls, they like to go with their parents. So she took me to Richmond. But I wasn't allowed to talk to the conductor. I couldn't be like the other kids, you know, and say things to the conductor and ride the train. I couldn't take pictures with the conductor because of the color of my skin. And even though I was only three, I never forgot it. I never forgot it. And when she got ready to go back to Richmond the following year, I didn't want to go. I never traveled since. And when I traveled this time, I didn't really want to travel. But then I had to start thinking that things is not the same anymore, it was different. But I took my godson with me. I told him, I said, well, the only way I'm going is you going with me. If you ain't going, I ain't going either. You know, that's it. You know, I said, you know, I ain't got time. I said, if somebody going to lock me up, because my big mouth going to come out. And this is the way I was when I was a kid. I didn't understand. And there's some things you just were not able to say. And my mom used to always have to look in my mouth when people say things to me. Because sometimes people ask you some dumb stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so my mom had to always be close by when a grown person is talking to me. You see what I'm saying? And I was a little fat kid. You know what I'm and I had that mean look. You know what I'm saying? And the people, you know, they just, just ask you dumb things. What do you mean? You know, I'm eating food just like you eat it. <laughs> and my mother would say, now they'll call me Lola, and she'll say, now Lola, that's not my way to talk to the people. Man, I used to be upset because I couldn't speak my mind. You hold all of that in. And as a young kid, that grows up in you, you know what I'm saying? And it made a lot of harshness. But with, Mr. Sam and Miss Mary, they like talk to us and stuff and they taught us different things, maybe things that our parents should have been teaching us, they taught us. You see what I'm saying? And all the way up until Mr. Sam had to be up in age, you know, like we were, uh, we had to grow up and he left and he went on to the uh, sheriff's department, somewhere in the sheriff's department and they got rid of our playground. But he made, he fought. We had swings, we had slides. We even had a little house where we kept the games and stuff, you know. He really fought. Because they didn't want us to have the playground. They wanted to build houses on it. And he fought for us. You see what I'm saying? And I said, it's not many people that you find like that. 
So this is where I got that from. Though I'm not being prejudiced or what have you, I just thought people didn't really care that deeply. That's of a different color. You see what I'm saying? But when I read David's book, and this is when it put tears into my eyes, I said, wow. I said, and he wasn't scared to test the waters. He wasn't scared to put his feet in the water and let it wade to see what'll happen. You see what I'm saying? And this is what we have to do, you know, is to try to get the understanding of each other. And as long as we're using these negative things or what have you, we're not going to ever understand each other. So, I, when I uh, was reading the book, I um, learned, you know, that David is really a nice, warm person. He really is. And he really, he really is selfish about what he really believes in. And nothing will change his mind. Once you read the book, you'll see what I'm understand, you know, what I'm saying to you, and you'll understand it even better. And it doesn't matter, and I know he had to be called all of these different kind of lovers and stuff coming down the lane. I know he did. I know he did. But he still hung in there. And he fought for what he believed. You know, we wasn't alone. And a lot of times when we think we're alone, we're not. And this is um one of the things, you know, that I was thinking about him and stuff. And when I was saying that, you know, he, he saw uh, what we saw, a lot of the wrongness that was going on, and he was trying to do the best he could to make it right, to help make it right, to cause attention to letting people know what was going on that was wrong. And he ended up getting the, the bottom of the, the stick of it, you know, for it. You know what I'm saying? And that hurts. It's not fair. It's not fair at all. And if we don't come together and start hollering at all the you know, you know, that man shouldn't have to die in that environment. It's not fair. I swear it's not fair. And it's nothing that he done to deserve that harsh treatment except for being friendly to a different skin color than his. That's not enough to do what you want to do to somebody. And the other thing that I want to say is, you know, I heard the statement last night when I was here at the meeting where a young lady was saying, you know, about the, the little uh, quote that they had out don't do the time if you don't want to do the time. You know, it used to make sense back then. It used to make sense back then. Don't do the crime if you don't want to do the time. But it seems like lately, as long as I have a navy blue sh um, uniform with a badge, I can do whatever I want to do and get away with it. So what's the difference? We have people locked up for years doing the same thing these police officers are doing out here and these lawyers being crooked, they get locked up. So you know, so what makes them so right because they have a uniform on? Wrong is wrong, and right is right. You understand what I'm saying? And no matter how you try to cover it up, you're wrong. You're wrong, and you're a thief. So this is like, you know, and I was reading, you know, and I, I said, you know, I'm looking at this, book and reading a lot of these phrases and different phrases and stuff in the book. And it brings back what life it really was back then. And it seems so hard because I always thought people of a different race didn't understand it the way we understood it. You see what I'm saying? Because the only thing I got was we black people was just troublemakers. No, we're not. We're trying to make people understand and see the difference of how we're being treated. You know, and everybody should be treated equal. And this is what I always felt. And when I tried to tell my mom and them that, oh Lord, you're going to be in prison. <laughs> I'm not going to prison. I'm just telling you how things should be. <laughs> now, you know, when you, when you bring the people from down south and stuff, they don't understand what they really need to be understood. You know, and like David, you know, Whatever I believed in, that's the way I lived my life. Yeah, I got thrown out of school. 
They were trying to sit me, send me up the river. I was just a kid, because me and the gym teacher couldn't get along, you know. But the thing of it is, is that sometimes when you're doing the right things and people know you're right, they ain't gonna come forward and tell you, but they'll stick up for you, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. there were teachers that kept me from going up the river, you know, as they used to say, you know. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. And I can really thank David from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, I do. Because I never knew that it was me like him, you know. I said, where do you find these type of people, you know, that really try to help you, you know. Then, to bring back forward, I ran into Leslie and Maid and Maid's dad and, you know, and Teresa. And it made me think so differently in life. And I wouldn't change it for nothing in the world. I thank God for bringing these people in my life. I even ran into Karima, you know, and I can talk to her. I know she's real busy, but she always takes the time when I have a problem or what have you, and she listens, you know. And, you know, I just like to let people know that things are so, you know, they're changing, but they only change to a certain extent. You know what I'm saying? And we shouldn't have to still be fighting for the, the same thing we was fighting for 50 or 60 years ago. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When are we going to move forward? Yeah. And these politicians, they're the ones that's keeping us stuck in block A. When is we going to get to C and D and E? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And these are the little snakeish things that they do. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they want people to agree with their wrongness. But if we be strong enough and we refuse to agree with their wrongdoing, we'll get somewhere. Because we don't have to take that. We don't have to take that. We pay taxes just like they do. <laughs> Pay more. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I ain't got nothing now. Every time I get it, they take it. You know. But but I'm gonna end this with you know I'm hoping from the group and from the people that came out. You know, thank you guys. I really mean that from heart. And I'm hoping y'all give things a thought so we can move forward. Mm -hmm. It's not you know that's don't dismiss tonight. She come all the way. From out of town, you know what I'm saying? To bring this to our attention. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, she deserves some sort of respect. And, you know, let her know we appreciate her. Mm -hmm. I know I appreciate her. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I stayed at her house when I went out of town on a retreat. And I was treated like a queen. <laughs> 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 Everybody can chip in if we have to, so we're gonna bus. Yes. Go as groups. And then the thing is what we're trying to show is, you know, don't let it just be all white or just all black. Because we want to fix them where they can't hollow racial. You see what I'm saying? We have to stand and stick together. And just like they have wrongfully 
um, black prisoners back there. They have wrongfully white people prisoners back there. David is an example. You know what I'm saying? And we want to fight for everybody. I don't care what color their skin is. We need to fight. So the fact that New York State Prison Justice Network is having an event in May for prison justice and all statewide, building a statewide voice for prison justice. Sheila was good enough to bring it up. Um, there will be some kind of transportation from Buffalo to, for you all to be part of building that statewide. <laughs> And Karima, are you going to be the point person? Today? I'll be the point person. Karima will be the point person. We met last year, it was fantastic. And we hope to get more people involved this year. And Buffalo is so important. Would you talk about that for two minutes? What it is? And yeah, um, it's going to be May 22nd. Now we can tell a little bit more about it I'll tell you. and what the network is. Just quickly. New York State Prisoner mm -hmm. Justice Network, um, online at nysprisonerjustice.org. Is a um, it's a network of, of dozens and dozens of prisoner justice organizations around mm -hmm. the country. Why don't I do a sign up sheet, by the way, so you could be on our listserv if you're interested? Um, could we borrow your pad and send her in a sign up? That'd be great. You want to take, can we take this off, mm -hmm. off and send it around? Mm -hmm. Love to have you on the listserv. Um, <coughs> it's a network of organizations involved in all sorts of prisoner justice. Uh, work uh, in New York State, uh, parole reform, a proposition to solitary confinement, change in the sentencing structure, um, shutting down prisons, shutting down more prisons, opposition to mass incarceration, opposition to the race-based outcomes in the prison system. Um, and we are doing a statewide um, we do. We have done for two years in a row now. Statewide <coughs> gathering so that people can, that people in this movement for prisoner justice can share with each other, strengthen each other, and um, do a range of things in opposition to this mass incarceration system. Some of it is legislative. Some of it is just New York State Prisoner Justice Network. New York State Prisoner Justice Network, and I can't believe I didn't bring brochures. I was on vacation before I came. NY, <laughs> NYSPrisonerJustice.org. Um, and and the particular thing in May is what? The particular thing in May is a statewide gathering of um, people, individuals and organizations in Albany to, do, to network with each other, to hear about the different work that's happening in opposition to mass incarceration. Uh, to meet with some legislators and push them to do a number of things, but particularly to support parole reform. And we're going to do a demonstration at the parole board to demand um, fairer parole, parole policies. One of the things that we hear from prisoners most strongly, we, the New York State Prisoner Justice Network um, it corresponds with prisoners so that we can find out what, so we can be prisoners as a central part of setting an agenda. It's, the agenda needs to be based in the people that are most affected. And um, what we hear, one of the things that we hear from prisoners is that the parole, the injustice of the parole policies drives people crazy because you go back to the board again and again and again, and no matter how clean your record is, they can re-sentence you based on the nature of your original crime. And so you've got people in prison for decades past their minimum sentence based on a parole board that has no accountability to anybody, minimal process, minimal opportunity to defend yourself. So you're being, it's, a, it's an invisible form of indefinite resentencing based on some, it, it sounds like it's based on somebody's will, but it's actually based on the politics of punishment and vengeance that's coming out of some sectors of the society, particularly being pushed by Push, it's pushed by law enforcement, it's being pushed by parts of the criminal justice system, pushed by prosecutors whose careers, are, whose careers are based on how many people are in prison, pushed by legislators from rural areas who think that it's a good way to have jobs in there. Anyway, there's an agenda of mass incarceration being pushed, and the parole board's denial of parole um, is a piece of this mass incarceration, a piece of people being in prison that shouldn't be there, that don't belong there, that could be productive members of their communities. Um, what we say in New York State Prisoner Justice is that the whole model of punishment on which mass incarceration is based is the wrong model. 
doesn't belong there at all. That we need community accountability. Sean is gonna Sean is gonna moderate. You guys, let, 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 let's hear you all talk. That's the correct model. Community accountability and um, rehabilitation, community-based justice, um, prevention, 